Well, first and foremost, um, I want to thank you, Donna, for being my moral giant, um, and for being not only my mentor in my work, but also an outstanding model of human courage. Your work on dignity is much needed in our world, and you have made huge advancements in that respect that affected many people in the world. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you to the Program on Negotiation, the Neiman Foundation, the Schoenstein Center, the Weatherhead Center, the Alliance for Peace Building, and uh, all that made this event happen, and particularly to the one and only Professor um, Herbert Kuhlman. Thank you for your inspiring work that revolutionized the study of international relations and for this seminar. Thank you uh, to all of you who have made it here. I'm honored by your presence. So first a disclaimer, I am recording my talk for archival and promotional purposes to share with my sponsor, the Fulbright Program. All right, so uh, the question we have here is what is dignity, right? Well, I really don't know. Okay, bye. <laughs> All right, well, as you expect, it is much of a struggle to define dignity because like many terms, it changed over time it comes, uh, it, it also has a personal connotation to each one of us, depending on your language. Uh, so, for instance, uh, where the word comes from in your language, in English, it comes from uh, Latin for dignitas, which refers to a rank, whereas in Arabic, it shares a trilateral consonantal root of karuma, which is the same as karam, or generosity uh, in Arabic. And here, karama uh, is Arabic for dignity. To define dignity also depends on your personal experiences as a human being that make you define dignity one way or the other. So in this study, I tried not to define dignity and not to use my understanding of dignity, which is one close to the mainstream definition we find of dignity or karama uh, being uh, human worth in order to find out the meanings of those who claim uh, dignity. So what my work and interviews showed is that it can be whatever you want it to be. Um, but of course, we have common signifiers so we can understand each other. And there are some key dimensions of dignity in the case of the 2011 Arab Spring protests in Egypt that I want uh, to show here. The theme of the Kalman seminar this year is negotiation, conflict, and the news media. And the topic I will be talking about today of what is dignity shows that to define dignity uh, is both a process of conflict and negotiating, particularly when there is the intersection of Islam, democracy, and human rights uh, in the societies of the Arab world that I focus on. There are the dignity enthusiasts, and the dignity skeptics. I am a dignity enthusiast, as you will see, because I believe that dignity is useful to improve our relationship one to the other, right? So that's simple. And to use the words of judge, French judge Christian Bic, that I think are quite, um, oops. I teach negotiations and corporate law Sorry. at Harvard Law School. So these are words that I find quite uh, powerful. We need the notion of dignity as a reminder that the perpetration of violence against others may create a negation not only of the humanity of others, but of our own humanity. Mm -hmm. So to um, also make you maybe a bit think about this concept, so I'm going to ask some questions, don't need to uh, answer, but just think about it. Um, so how is your dignity today? Is it any of my business? Should your state protect it? Do you have it no matter what you do, or does it depend on what you do? Is dignity something you should, uh, that your, care, your state should protect or not? Is dignity something um, important or is it nonsense? So are you feeling a headache? Well, that has been my happy headache for some years, uh, well, up to now. Um, 
And to put you a bit in the mood, I would like to start with this short excerpt from the 1934 movie, The House of the Rothschild, in which we see a dying father Rothschild giving some valuable advice to his sons. Um, this is not only a moment of nostalgia for uh, Hollywood productions of the 30s, but also an example of how resounding this short speech is to many different groups uh, in the world who are subject to a form of oppression or exclusion. Oh, wait one second. So, oh yeah, I didn't plug this in. The house where they were all born. Remember this before all. Neither business nor power nor all the gold in Europe will bring you happiness till we, our people, have equality, respect, dignity, to trade with dignity, to live with dignity, to walk with the world. So we have here uh, the idea of we will not stop until we are recognized, until we showcase our dignity. And dignity is something to care about because it helps diagnose a serious problem of exclusion. To be so excluded that you need to claim dignity is like the last frontier of ostracizing a group or an individual. But there is another problem with this concept. So if it is what defines us, what makes us uh, human beings worthy of, of, of uh, a value of being treated fairly, then how can we be stripped of it? Here there is a distinction that we need to make between dignity as a status and dignity as a universal human component. But most people, most of the time, do not make this distinction, and th this is utterly uh, confusing. So, for instance, I hear statements like, um, oh, the Nigerian uh, police officers do not have any dignity, when it should be more like, well, some police officers are corrupt, right? Or, oh, Chinese academics do not have any dignity, when it should be more like, well, Chinese academics suffer from censorship. Or, oh, today I don't want uh, to act with dignity. It should be, I do not want to act in a way that is likely to be validated by dominant moral constructs of behavior. Mm -hmm. All right, this is a bit too long, maybe. Mm -hmm. And we must make a point uh, to change this language because it spreads uh, a mistaken understanding that dignity is negotiable when it's not. It is there, and it must be asserted uh, if it is overlooked. Now, moving on to exposing my research uh, findings to you. The main parts in this presentation uh, will concentrate on the background and the process of the research and then the discussion of the findings. So, the problem that led me to this research is that I was concerned by the several measurable issues in the third world, and I feel that I'm uh, definitely part of, of uh, uh, this community. So of course, poverty issues, governance issues, human rights violations, security issues. But what about beyond the visible? What about traumas, and what are their effects? Another problem I found is that dignity as a concept is often studied in bioethics and philosophy, and there is a lack of a clear discussion of dignity as a powerful social and personal concept in political science. In the, the study of political science, we give more importance to the study of institutions, structures, and procedures. In economics, on the other hand, we are seeing increasing attention uh, for quite some time now, to non-material dimensions of well-being, right? Well, there are some responses to this lack, obviously, so uh, the way I went about my literature review was to look at uh, if the different disciplines in social sciences and studies that focused on 
the concept of dignity. So in historical studies, um, we, and particularly looking at dignity in the case of uh, the history of Egypt, uh, we see that in Egyptian society and politics, the use of the concept of dignity benefited from a context of feelings of humiliation, backwardness, and the sense of helplessness spread among the local populations since the free officers uh, revolution in 1952 that kicked out the Muhammad Ali uh, dynasty of uh, foreign origin, Albanian origin. And this negative mood was also exacerbated by the increasing number of Egyptians in poverty. In sociology, um, we have uh, uh, the look at how key concepts drive revolution and of course the notable work of uh, Baritone Moore. Um, so he talked about the importance of the bourgeoisie in triggering revolutions and leading demands. Um, Asif Bayat right, uh, also used the work of uh, Moore and uh, stress the importance of moral outrage, right? So uh, the, the uh, uh, driving of, of moral outrage in the case of political protest in the Middle East. We also have the recent collaborative uh, work of Michel Lamont on the recognition gap, right? So these, uh, this cultural exclusion, if you want, that is useful to provide uh, evidence that marginalization is damaging and could be tackled via inclusive policies. In development studies, of course, Martha Nussbaum's work on capacity building uh, and non-material dimensions of uh, uh, well-being, and she, of course, uh, focuses much on, on dignity. We have also Feng Xia on the incompatibility between uh, a global capitalist context um, and a genuine expansion of a society of rights and human rights. So this incompatibility creates this, this frustration, right? So this, this almost assault on, on dignity. In political science, early on, the work of Kertzer, um, in trying to look at the, how key concepts uh, and big defining concepts can uh, 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 drive political uh, movements, so we look at how different issues and agendas can bring civil role political movements to intermingle in a form of solidarity without consensus, um, and then strengthen the momentum of, of, for instance, a political opposition. We have also this problem of differentiation between reality and expectations, uh, and particularly in the context of uh, global development which in consequence leads to this idea of life as a spectacle, right? Driven by consumerism and even the consumption of political demands. In terms of work also in political science trying to be more pragmatic about uh, dignity, we have Shorsh Katib on um, the importance of human dignity to strengthen the political claim of human rights. And uh, in that sense, achieve better democracy. Sami Zemni, who wrote about the Arab Spring, brought an important insight on the need for what he called a moral economy. So here meaning an economy where we respect norms and values. And this is something lacking uh, for him in the context of predatory practices in business and even in public administration that we find in many Arab uh, countries. In psychology, we have the groundbreaking work of Donna Hicks, and we're lucky to have her with us today. As a conflict uh, resolution expert, you noticed the damaging power of dignity wounds, particularly when dignity is not honored. Also, studies have shown that assaulting dignity triggers the same parts uh, in one's brain than those stimulated by physical pain. So this supports your argument that um, we should uh, protect people's dignity from harm as those who are hurt turn violent in doing so. So there is here uh, uh, really much of a need to do so. You also underscore the legitimacy of demanding dignity that one could see with the immediate and widespread sympathy for the protesters uh, in the so-called Arab Spring. 
In philosophy, we have several works. Uh, I'm singling out Michael Wilson's, uh, who is a dignity skeptic, right? Uh, so he prefers to refer to dignity as a code of conduct rather than a defined concept uh, because this, of this problem of confusion, right, with dignity. But he still uses it and he finds that it's uh, 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 much helpful in action, right? So this idea of treating people with dignity. In post-colonial studies, Looking at them is helpful to understand the context of Egypt and uh, societies of the global south. Um, and Chatterjee, Parta Chatterjee's work uh, on the emergence of new models of political participation in the post-colonial world, such as forms of survival bargain with the state. So in which uh, the most marginalized, the poorest, actually can use a moral pressure on the state. And that is very relevant in the case of Egypt, even if uh, Chatterjee talks about uh, India. <coughs> Chatterjee's work is also in line with uh, Homi Baba's theory on the third space. So this space in which we find the possibility of an unlikely dialectic. So this possible communication between the oppressed and the oppressor. Overall, in addition to the role of dignity as an unfulfilled quest, right, that we find in these post-colonial studies, um, and this is in the context of uh, continuing repression and humiliation, we see that it also has the, the, the capacity of legitimizing protests, right? And both these roles, right, so this unfulfilled quest and legitimization of, of my, my complaint, right, uh, is useful uh, for the protesters. So my topic is uh, karama, uh, not dignity, all right? But to me, the, the terms are equivalent. So, so I'm using them as, as equivalents. And choosing karama aims to understand the, co the, the concept in its cultural context. Why this matters? Well, dignity is a nebulous concept, right? So we, try, we need to try to understand it. It does not mean one thing, and why should it? It can be respect, honor, faith, work. So it's a box that can be filled with meanings. And uh, in the revolution, uh, it was used among other slogans, but so did protesters in the US, in Wall Street, or in Cibeles in Madrid, or people battling for marriage rights. Also, the, the backgrounds of the slides are actually made of uh, world cloud diagrams that I obtained uh, from public tweets in Arabic script um, between the period of December uh, 15, 2010, so that was the early days of uh, the Arab Spring, up to April 30th, uh, 2013, so this is before the so-called Second Revolution, right, where we got rid of the Muslim Brotherhood leader, uh, Mohamed Morsi. Um, and actually, uh, the word karama is right here, so it's actually one of the terms that were most recurrent. Mm -hmm. Well, regardless of one's definition of dignity, it is undeniably the source of human rights as implicitly or explicitly suggested in institutions of rights. So there is here a lot at stake in taking uh, dignity seriously. In terms of the objectives of the research, well, those are to understand <coughs> politics of dignity that has become fashionable and try not to take this concept uh, for granted, which is quite hard, and find the understandings of those concerned um, uh, directly. So trying to show that dignity and demanding uh, 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 karama is an instance of something, right, within the rhetoric of uh, the revolution. The purpose of the study is also to engage uh, with the concept beyond meanings that are dictated by a global view of the concept based on universality of human rights, for instance, so these structuralist views, right, and that sees dignity as a human right to try and reify um, an abstract form of the concept. Some of the research questions are, what are some of the uh, understandings of karama in the 2011 uprisings in Egypt? 
and how can they inform our understandings of uh, such concepts? What can we learn from the politics of dignity in this case, um, from the Egyptian society during the 2011 Arab Spring, uh, that could help us understand political and development uh, issues in this society, and uh, to some extent in societies where we see similar struggles? <coughs> in terms of uh, what I'm trying to say here, well, I argue that there are multiple understandings of karama. And this rejects statements like, that attempt to actually present an Egyptian understanding of karama or dignity, or a Western understanding of karama or dignity, and more importantly, a universal understanding of karama or dignity. Also, the vague and oftentimes inexistent uh, definitions of dignity in constitutions, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, uh, which represents uh, a non-binding customary international law, and other legal texts, uh, uh, such as uh, corporate bylaws, facilitate the politicization of dignity claims to serve particular uh, interest groups. I also argue that the variety of issues attached to claims of dignity gives an insight on structural, so here meaning stemming from a global view, so structural problems of a capitalist order, right? So this widening gap between the rich, the middle class, and uh, the poor. And also uh, an insight on the interference of religion and politics. And we will see with the theme of karama as faith, right? Uh, particularly Islam and of course also on issues of uh, social and political development. So the focus of uh, this study here is not to explore the etymology of the word karama, but to see how um, the use of this word in a specific context can help one understand elements about how knowledge is constructed uh, in uh, uh, such society. My study does not aim also at defining karama, but it aims at observing the performance of the karama signifier. So I want also to uh, tell you a bit about the background of this research. So before the Arab Spring started and rocked my world, I was actually looking at uh, uh, Nasser. So Nasser, this uh, uh, hero of the pan-Arabist movement, uh, and also as a personification of Karama, uh, and the leader of the, also the third world, defying the imperialist West. Um, and when the, the Arab Spring started, I was quite surprised to see young people in Tahrir Square brandishing photos right, of Nasser as this hero of Karama, when actually, um, well, the leader they are trying to get rid of, right, Mubarak, his regime is just a continuation of Nasser, right? So there was this, this uh, uh, let's say, well, inconsistency, if you want. So I tried to look at um, the, uh, and I was looking at uh, the uh, 1956 nationalization uh, of the Suez Canal as this moment of Karama, right, during the Nasser era and trying to compare it with the new moment of demanding karam as well in the 2011 revolution in Egypt. And this comparison showed that there is an Arabs people problem with karam. And this is in the context of problems of clientelism, human rights violations, and uh, this is despite actually most countries in the region being middle income countries, right? So they are actually um, performing worse on these indicators <coughs> than they should, right? My research interest in um, post-colonial development also focuses on this institutional and cultural relationship between states and society, right, and how it is evolving. And looking at dignity is quite uh, insightful in that sense. At first, in the beginning of the post-colonial era, dignity was mirrored in sovereignty and self-determination. So even if it meant autonomy, it related to the collective, right? And what we have in the case of Egypt is a movement 
from a collective understanding of karama, dignity, to an individual one. So in the transition from the comparison I mentioned earlier to a focus on the demand of dignity in the 2011 protest in Egypt, I looked at a form of um, genealogy, right? So a contextual genealogy. So here, not an etymological genealogy uh, of dignity or karama in Egypt, and it's not also a chronological genealogy, but more of a thematic uh, one. Early in the protests, uh, as I said, young people brandished photos of Nasser as a personification of dignity and defiance. This time, instead of targeting foreign powers, the enemy was within, right? The enemy uh, was this local leadership that abused its powers, oppressed and humiliated all kinds of people. Then this outrage with local leadership seemed to gain global momentum as it echoed with protesters in different parts of the world, north and south, right? So we can think of the indignados in um, Spain. And in the case of many societies, and particularly in the Arab world, the youth were even more receptive to these calls for dignity because they are the most marginalized and excluded group uh, uh, in these societies. And at the same time, paradoxically, uh, they are the most important group in society just because of sheer numbers and also potential to contribute to the state. In Egypt, many uh, youth civil groups uh, had a key role in the protests. Uh, of course, notable one, the April 6th movement, and uh, the video of Asma Mahfouz, so she is a, a, a key member of, of the uh, six, April 6th movement, uh, and allegedly uh, her video is considered the video that triggered the revolution uh, as she called for people to descend to Tahrir Square on January 25th, 2011, in the name of Karama. So, my main idea here was to capture the multiplicity and contradictions in understanding cornerstone concepts like dignity and refute the argument that there could be a universal understanding of uh, this concept. So I started with these uh, with pilot interviews to try and get the model of, for, for my methodology, my research. Um, I had bad experiences with questionnaires, and uh, uh, they seemed impersonal. Same goes for uh, surveys. Uh, also structured interviews uh, were problematic. So I opted for a more loose structure uh, of, of for the interviews to give this uh, space for uh, uh, my interviewees to express themselves uh, and share their understandings uh, of, of uh, uh, the concept and also of their participation in the revolution. It's also important here to remember that the interview is not a normal setting, right? Uh, because people justify their stances versus my questions. They were also empirical in the aftermath of the revolution, not during. So these were exercises in memory. Uh, and this methodology is, is adequate for the objectives uh, as there is here no intention to speak for all, but rather capture the fluid thoughts of people uh, and their emotions and sensitivities that are actually often changing. And more importantly, it helps uh, me construct my own understandings because of my feelings uh, of belonging to the community uh, um, affected by the Arab Spring. So this started in the Arab Spring, right, in the early uh, uh, days uh, um, and uh, up to last year. I used mostly two tools. So first, the interviews. Uh, and oftentimes, I, I interviewed people at least twice. And that was very uh, insightful in this actually changing of understandings for only one person. Um, what was the time frame, the break between the two interviews? It depended on their availa availability. So sometimes it was actually uh, after the second revolution, so that really impacted their understanding of, of uh, Karama. And uh, uh, sometimes it was uh, 
well, uh, maybe just a few months, so before the revolution, the second revolution. Uh, okay. and, but still there, there were these changes as well. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Um, I, these uh, um, uh, interviews, as I said, uh, uh, were also um, retrospective in nature, so they um, uh, used this cognitive work of reconstructing memory. I also use what I call human expressions. So these are graffiti, novels, cartoons, films that happened in the space of the revolution or that are related to the space of the revolution. And uh, many times the interviewees would point me to a relevant song or artwork that I need to check out. So what came out was from these uh, 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 preliminary rounds and also later on, is that there are these big categories, right? So uh, these main themes that people associate with Karama. Well, Karama as faith, right? And mostly Islam. Karama as identity, and mostly an Arab problem. Of course, Karama as a human right. And Karama as materiality. So mostly job, money, or other uh, material possessions. Well, yeah, sorry. But Karama is a concept that has impact, right? It also brought together people who thought very different things of dignity under one same slogan. So the findings in this research show a multiplicity of understandings that also stresses the importance of the epistemological framework of socioeconomic groups and individuals in which their understanding of the, uh, uh, of the concepts like dignity can be backed by reason, personal life experiences, your mood, right? Or religion, for instance. Uh, the study's limitations are in terms of the representation, right? So uh, uh, most of my interviewees were educated individuals with experiences abroad. So that's also reflected my own profile. Um, and of course, this represents also uh, just a small portion of uh, society. There were also these cognitive efforts from interviewees and myself. So this, uh, well, uh, uh, attempt to reconstruct memory, a tendency to s be self-aggrandizing, right? And also uh, sometimes exaggerate facts. There were also these uh, scales of personal preferences when dealing with the themes. So most of the time the themes just appeared in the discussion, right? So because these are very relevant topics to uh, Karama. But when they didn't, uh, in, in a few cases, I would try to direct the discussion to maybe the missing theme, right? So some people really like talking about, well, this problem of dignity as money, right? How it's corrupt in our society or how it is actually just the way things are right now. And then uh, maybe there was maybe greater importance to religion, for instance. But in most cases, there was this modernity critique as a backdrop, mm -hmm. which implies modernity's influence on Karama. And this is also a critique that I found in uh, different literatures in my research. There was also this uh, dichotomy between materialism versus post-materialism, which represents a conception of one's identity. And it also stresses this link between uh, dignity and identity. This uh, dichotomy is actually similar to, uh, to the one Chatterjee makes about the post-colonial society. So for him, in post-colonial society, we have either a civil society, right, in the classic sense, so a society that is concerned by the community interests, right, so collective interests, uh, and he uh, uh, comments that it's actually shrinking and it's not much effective in such societies. Whereas what he coins the political society, right, is the one of the destitute, right, or those constrained by precarity. And because of their conditions, they actually can use this uh, moral pressure on the state, right? So this is how they bargain with the state. And they are, uh, to him, uh, more, more effective in that sense. They are also uh, quite self-interested, right? So there is also here this difference. There was also this awareness of international political economy's impact 
on uh, local societies, creating a culture of money and predation, and the recurring uh, topic of economic expectation. So this problem of differential between reality and expectation that creates emotional uh, frustration. It is important here to remember that in the period preceding uh, um, the uh, Arab Spring in Egypt, the Sadat and Mubarak regimes had particularly disfavored the urban salariat. Middle East uh, expert Ashar Sasser also talked about the difficulty of a young generation um, and coined it in, so the difficulty to actually live and coined it in the status of waithood, right? So waiting to get a job, waiting to marry, waiting to uh, actually leave the parental house. You call that waithood? Waithood, yes. In the status of waithood. Um, so these are quite, I mean, basic demands, right? But interestingly, there was something else maybe to understand about uh, these demands for karama in this context that are even more basic, right? And this is where uh, the Arab identity brings something new uh, to uh, dignity in this context. So one of the remarks was that there is something about the feeling of being an Arab. So what I refer to as Arabness in my research that made the protesters think that their identity makes them some sort of noble and elevated soul. Yet the reality of oppression and the difficulty to achieve their ideals reinforced the thinking that they are almost too good to be on this earth because one cannot have heaven on earth. In addition, one of the ideas in this research seen through the interviews is that sentiments against a colonial structure and internal colonization, right? So this enemy within were present in Egypt in 2011, even if this was over half a century after uh, the country gained independence. But this time it was about internal colonizers, right? So those deemed enemies uh, of Egypt. The feelings of helplessness at the time also triggered a need to transform humiliation into self-esteem through a revolutionary act. And the, of course, best but unfortunate example is Mohamed Bouazizi's self-immolation, right? Such acts also created a sense that gaining back karama was both urgent and priceless, but also a basic step to any other endeavor. So other uh, themes, as I mentioned, are uh, karama's uh, faith, and in retrospect, this is much relevant to this Islamist alternative in the countries of the region of the Arab Spring as providers of karama. And the fact that most of the Islamist groups were either contained right, or oppressed makes their potential to be providers of karama even more alluring, right? because they didn't have the full chance to deliver. The theme of Karama's human rights, very uh, important and close to demands of freedom. So these rights are, uh, as, as George Katz had mentioned, what links Karama or dignity to the uh, political and political agency and independence. Yet they were not very central uh, because protesters seem to be pointing at something more basic than human rights uh, and democracy. This theme, of human rights is also particularly important to my own sensitivities. And as globalist Diana Bryden puts it, and I agree, the history of post-colonialism is first the history of human rights. Moreover, the association of, uh, between dig the concept of dignity and the rise of the human rights discourse as part of the modernity project often prompts a critical engagement with the concept, right? So the idea that human rights came right, with colonialism with, and post-colonialism and, and uh, the West. So there is maybe here a bit of, uh, um, uh, well, uh, reservation uh, regarding human rights. So what I'm, my, or the idea I'm, I'm suggesting here to um, describe, right, dignity in the case of protests, 
is this idea of dignition, right? And this is a portmanteau between dignity and recognition. Uh, in Arabic, etiraf for recognition and karama, so etikram. In French, dignité, reconnaissance, dignissance. Um, so I'm just playing with it. And um, it's important here to remember that in this study, I was first particularly interested in the claim of karama and why it is now all of a sudden important and why these global connections affect us. My former comparison uh, with the Swiss nationalization tried to disprove that it's only now, right? Um, the study suggested a specific need of recognition, whereas now I am moving the idea of dignition to a pressing and urgent yet basic demand, right? So this is a suggested concept still under construction, but I guess it's also on, in line with uh, Donna's view on actually uh, not saying need, right? Uh, because it might entail that we lack dignity and that's, that's problematic. The context of increasing global connections in our societies also matters uh, greatly. So the literature in political science on the region often speak of Arab exceptionalism. And this seems to contrast a possible homogenization uh, due to globalization, right? So most systems are, I mean, are expected to be more homogenized. And this Arab exceptionalism helps to uh, explain this, the endurance, right, of authoritarianism and oppression in these uh, systems. But as the notable uh, Professor Roger Owen notes in his most recent uh, book about the Arab Spring, the protests proved the end of the so-called Arab exceptionalism because they reflected a global phenomenon of moral outrage <coughs> due to indecent inequalities. So dignition is an attention catcher. It screams, I am here. It has this ability to signify many things to many and different people. And this is in line with my argument we saw at the beginning that politics of dignity is a catch-all uh, political demand serving particular and varying uh, interests. So, to conclude, the idea with this study was not to look at dignity per se, but per context. And see that karama has a meaning in context. For instance, for a worried father, karama is raising a good son. Dignity as a concept can be a moment. So one person thinking um, different things about uh, the concept, a feeling. So this shows how important uh, it is to reinstitute the term in the form of life. The demands um, for karama were also linked to the process, to the actually power, sorry, of moral outrage, right? So this power to stand to injustice. Seeing politicization of dignity through emotions is also something I would like to add to this idea and suggestion of uh, dignition. And remember a concept uh, in construction. So the fact that dignition triggers, right, these emotions and this is where its power comes from. So this also helped uh, to understand why in my first study comparing 2011 to 1956 uh, in Egypt, um, I used the, the term need instead of demand, right? So more of an emotional need, right? Rather than an actual need of, of uh, dignity. So this is significant in the context of global calls for human empowerment and development. And uh, looking at Egypt is very useful to understand the Arab world. What I'm also proposing is looking at social concepts in practice and in the field and take the meanings um, from those concerned instead of going into the field with our academic uh, understandings. And the aim is to witness a negotiation of the ways these terms may be relevant and meaningful at one particular moment in historical time. 
In terms of applications, well, um, we are seeing processes of legalizing dignity, and here meaning uh, making moving dignity from this fluffy right concept that we find somewhere in the preamble right of constitutions to become a constitutional right. And uh, the work of Aharon Barak is uh, going into uh, that direction. We also have now public debates on understandings, uh, uh, on understanding karama uh, or dignity. And this helps uh, trigger further research in political science on the question of dignity in light of hot debates such as the refugee crisis, for instance. Where this fits, well, interdisciplinary, uh, so in political science, political sociology, but also in line with the post-colonial approach to world politics and globalization. And what's next, at least for me, well, um, I am uh, looking now at other understandings of dignity through a global survey, so here also to zoom out, right? Uh, and it's again fascinating uh, to find so many differences in understanding the concept. I'm also looking at the 2014 Constitution in Tunisia, and this is one of the constitutions that mentions most human dignity. My working thesis uh, is that understandings of dignity in drafting uh, the 2014 Constitution of uh, Tunisia produced both conflict and consensus among competing interest groups in Tunisian society. Um, so particularly this uh, competition between secularists and Islamists. Uh, for example, we see consensus regarding the importance of uh, creating an institution of dignity uh, providing rights in line with a recognition of individual dignity. But we see conflicts, uh, for instance, regarding understandings of worth. And uh, worth is very important to define dignity. Um, and worth, for instance, in line with the religious narrative, uh, particularly concerning women's empowerment, right? Um, so there was this infamous article of uh, women completing men, right? So this might, so this is a demeaning, right? Women completing men and problematic, but in a religious narrative, it's actually appreciated, right? So it's, it means this harmony between women and men. Um, the finding so far is that for, for the way demands for dignity uh, work is in a sense like a diagnosis, right? So um, for something else, right? And dignity has the power to propel, right? So catapult. <laughs> um, one's demand to the forefront, right? So when this demand is tied to dignity. So for example, if I say I want to marry, right? Well, this is my problem, right? Uh, and it's not such a big deal. But if I say to allow me to marry is to give me my dignity, right? I made my uh, demand much more important. So because this tie into dignity legitimizes the complaint and uh, the suffering, it also seems that there are two levels of dignity assaults by, as expressed by individuals. So first, an individual sense, mostly psychological sense of my human pain, and a collective sense, so mostly a sociological one, uh, of moral outrage. And this shows how my pain becomes yours, too. So an assault on dignity is not only the ill of one person, but it can be contagious, right? So even if uh, the others are not hurt directly. Lastly, the economic dimension of demands of dignity uh, is also very important in our context of globalizing economies. And for that matter, Sarah Chase, uh, a most recent book on um, kleptocracies shows how many people actually feel that corruption is a human right. Uh, and that is in line with uh, uh, the Tunisian case where demands for dignity are increasingly becoming demands for economic reparation, right? The 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights also lists economic rights. So uh, we have access to property, paid vacation, social security, and analysts uh, and uh, the philosopher Elizabeth Anderson mostly related such economic rights to human dignity. So in the case of increasing inequalities, 
dignity can unlock and legitimize greater access to resources to all people uh, and improve their experience of life when they securely access these resources. So I would like to end with a musical note from a hip hop group from Egypt, the Arabian Nights, mm -hmm. quite known for their revolution themed song. So the poster reads, thank you, young people of Egypt and Facebook, and thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. So there were 30 interviews, um, and um, so these are codes, so anonymized, right? And um, the way I selected them was uh, actually just through snowball effect, so I, I had to snowball effect. Uh -huh. So I uh, had some my, of my contacts uh, 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 that I used to ask uh, about people who protested uh, in uh, Tahrir or in other parts of Cairo in the revolution, right? So the revolution meaning uh, the from January 25th to February uh, 11th. So this is when. Um, Mubarak was out, right? So that was the time frame. So they had to be people that were there uh, in the revolution. Um, there was no intention to have a balanced group. It was really just to have actually uh, uh, people that were willing to express themselves. But <coughs> of course, I, I tried to have a bit of a, uh, a balance. So for instance, I, I didn't have much uh, uh, contacts with uh, non-Muslims, right? Uh, so I, I asked actively for that, right? Um, I um, also, in terms of gender balance, uh, um, it, it's uh, about balance, so I, I was a bit, it was more men, right? But I, I try to uh, 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 be attentive to that. In terms of age, uh, actually it's, it's uh, well, to uh, maybe a bit older than you would expect, yeah, right? Yeah, I'm surprised at that. Yes. Um, um, and the, the numbers here are about actually how many, uh, when these interviews were recurrent. So uh, again, here there were some people that I could only interview once, and some I was able to interview up to four times. Um, and uh, during the discussion, so the, the interviews uh, would go from maybe a bit less than an hour, up to three hours sometimes. Uh, um, and um, the main question was, what made you go there, right? So that was almost like the hook, just let's start with this. Um, and oftentimes, very quickly, there was uh, a discussion of humiliation, uh, dignity coming up quite uh, uh, at the beginning. and a particular theme, right, to discuss. And if one of my themes was not discussed, I would try to bring uh, it to, to um, the discussion. I didn't have that dimension in mind when doing my analysis, but I, um, uh, well, from my recollection, I don't think that there was much of a difference in terms of gender impact in understanding of karama. Um, to me, what was most salient was religiosity mm -hmm. um, rather than gender. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, in favor of legal action. Um, and uh, in the case of Egypt, uh, I think that it would be maybe meaningful to look at cases <coughs> from the region because there might be uh, more of a lesson to learn and similarities. Um, so looking at the constitutional changes that happened in Tunisia and that uh, 
are to me more successful and could be a model of, for Egypt. So um, the, 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 the constitution in Egypt is quite problematic. It uh, was, uh, well, revised very superficially. Uh, and there is uh, also pretty much a, a, a jeopardy of, of, of constitution. So it's not taken seriously, right? We, we have uh, provisions that could make maybe a uh, um, human rights uh, violation more pers 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 um, persecuted, but they're, they're not. Um, so first, changing the constitution, right? Um, and also, uh, um, uh, well, using the constitution to have clear laws on torture, for instance, right? on also uh, discussing uh, the problem of how we uh, um, convict uh, well, these so-called uh, uh, enemies of the state, right? Why do they uh, get these exped expedited uh, um, well, uh, uh, convictions maybe in, in martial courts, right? Uh, so these are things that, that need to be tackled in order to maybe improve, right? Um, the status of, of Karam. Well, um, so this actually reminds me of, of the question of uh, criminalizing maybe uh, indignities in some way. Okay. And uh, in that sense, um, uh, there is uh, some work done. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to actually use uh, the so if you want to reference Eric Bleich's work, hey, so no, uh, e Bleich, so uh, B-L-E-I-C-H. Uh, so he uh, talked about the freedom to be racist, right? And he looks at how uh, uh, in the US, we give much more uh, weight to liberty, freedom, the values of liberty and freedom. So you have the first amendment, right? Uh, about freedom of speech, and this is very important in this country. But actually, it shows that we have uh, cases where we uh, um, have anti-racist laws, right? Um, so we limit, in some way, this freedom of speech, right? Because it, 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 it can uh, incentivize uh, violence, right? And in the case of Europe, for instance, where we have more of explicit laws on anti-Semitism, for instance, right? So these are clearly anti-racist uh, 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 laws. And uh, there it's because we have a greater, actually, attention to the idea of dignity of people, right? More um, than freedom, right? But even in Europe, so we have more of laws, but actually sometimes they're not uh, used. So that can be even more frustrating, right? So this is almost showing how it's, it's hard, right, to, to find the right way, right? So do we criminalize like Europe, right? But we might have a problem of actually sometimes not using it and creating greater frustration, or, well, just uh, uh, standing for freedom of speech, like in the US, but actually there are limitations to the so-called freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that uh, in the case of uh, the US, there were uh, some cases that he mentioned where we see uh, this attempt to uh, maybe, well, correct these, or, or, or uh, deal with these indignities, right? So when uh, we have this, this maybe language that, that is racist and, and uh, targeting uh, uh, some groups um, and where there was uh, prosecution, right? So we prosecuted those, those uh, people. So I, I think that when that happens, that is a way to deal with this problem. And um, what he is showing is that in the US, we have a bit of a retraction on actually more prosecution. So he sh showed that there was more in the 1990s. Um, oh, okay, okay. So that now there is a bit less. So I think that uh, if there is maybe a, a bit more of a, uh, a clearer uh, discourse uh, that really uh, uh, laws on anti-racism are important, right? So maybe toning down a bit this freedom of speech at all costs could be something that uh, uh, would maybe create more of a context of, of uh, uh, dealing with indignities in the US. Um, well, um, in terms of 
uh, why uh, dignity was the framing uh, element um, and why it's particular in the uh, Arab societies or in, in the, this case Egypt. Um, so from what I have been uh, seeing in my research, uh, the reason why it was so maybe uh, uh, resounding to, to uh, these people in these social movements was uh, because it's, uh, the, oftentimes it was directed to this problem of identity, right? And I think that the problem of identity is quite unique to the Arab world. And in this sense, in the context of the uh, also colonial experience, right? So we have uh, this feeling that uh, uh, there was this humiliation, right, from, from uh, colonialism. We have also, in some cases, these almost uh, manufacturer identities, right? So of these new countries, right? Uh, uh, so th this idea of, of we're, we're still working out who we are, really. Um, and I think also that there is almost this uh, uh, trauma in the Arab uh, world of, of uh, uh, well, we lost it all, right? So uh, we went from up to down, right? Um, so th th this tragedy of the Arabs and, and what uh, um, uh, um, Bernard Lewis talked about, well, what went wrong with the Arab world, where there is something wrong, this, this going from the, 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 those go golden uh, eras of, of uh, 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 maybe, uh, uh, well, uh, civilization mm -hmm. to, to now uh, humiliation. So I think that fits in, this, this framing of identity that is uh, um, maybe, um, much powerful. Um, in terms of the unique features about dignity, so uh, this is, so the, the unique feature is uh, compared to other demands, dignity is more basic, right? In the sense that it unlocks the other, let's say, uh, uh, maybe claims, right? So the claim of justice, right? Of, of liberty, right? So dignity has this, this uh, well, at least now in our understanding and in our uh, institutions, the way we put it as something that uh, is the source of human rights, right? So I think this is where it is very important, right? So it, it is the source of the humanity of people. And in that sense, it has a unique feature uh, uh, and a power to unlock other possible uh, maybe um, uh, demands. Uh, so actually, the um, well, the, the first question regarding uh, this uh, maybe uh, possible link between dignity and pride. Um, in my comparison that I mentioned, I actually talk about that. So when I mentioned this uh, change and movement of dignity from a collective understanding to an individual one, and in the case of uh, Egypt again, uh, there was at first, a clear link between dignity and pride, because uh, this idea of self-determination, right? So as a nation, we are now independent, right? We are autonomous. So this is linked to the land, right? And so here, very material, right? So, so the, 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 we are proud of our land. Um, and uh, even Nasser, so he would also, in his speeches, talk about Hezza uh, Mokaram, right? So Hezza being this, this sense of, of honor, pride, right? And yes, they are different, right? Of course, uh, uh, there, there, there is here a need to do a clear distinction. In, but again, we need to remember that for now, for us now, this is clearly, uh, uh, it's clearly two separate things. But if we go back in time, right, we might not have the same maybe feeling toward these terms, right? We might maybe see them more as, as closer. And we don't know what ha would happen maybe in the future, right? Well, but what, why is this separation? Sorry? Why this notion were linked uh, at the beginning of the revolution and now they are not? Well, what happened? Well, it was not before the revolution. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, even before the revolution was clearly yeah. two separate things. I, I'm, I'm talking more about just the immediate post-independence, right, era, where uh, th this, this uh, idea of national uh, dignity as, as, as uh, uh, our land was maybe stronger. 
Um, and maybe why it changed? Well, when we look at history, right, after World War II, we have now these institutions of human rights that emerge and become strong. So this individualized sense of dignity also was due to that, right? And it spread all over the world to some extent. Um, um, so you mentioned, for instance, faith. So here, when there was this understanding of faith, sometimes it was also linked to pride, right? So the pride of being uh, Muslim, for instance, right? So this, this idea that uh, uh, th there is this, this greatness about being Muslim and having dignity from that. Um, and uh, yes, in the discourse of Nasser, uh, there was this idea that, that uh, Egypt right, was the pride of the Arab world. Um, in terms of linking dignity to uh, uh, inequality, so I, I talked uh, about the uh, later, or the la a bit of my latest work, so th this is when looking at the economic dimension of uh, dignity. Um, so, uh, um, so here how um, actually uh, human dignity can, can justify our uh, claim to economic rights. Right? So we need to have these uh, economic rights in the name of dignity. And uh, a reading of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights actually shows that, right? That uh, uh, we can claim, uh, uh, let's say, those economic rights in the name of uh, dignity. So the, the problem of these inequalities, right, makes then the, let's say, the, the, the problem of actually, uh, 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 well, uh, justifying dignity as an institution problematic, right? So how can we have dignity as what, it, what defines us, as what makes us all equal, when we have these huge inequalities, and even, uh, I mean, increasing inequalities, right? Um, and the way actually to, I think, to me to deal with that is, is to enforce more economic rights. So the same way uh, we need to enforce more, maybe, uh, of course, laws on torture, we also need to enforce or on, on anti-racist, or on, sorry, racist uh, speech, right? We also have to have laws on economic rights, right? Um, Maybe hard, right? <laughs> I mean, I feel like we've just kind of opened up Pandora's box here. <laughs> There's so much we could, so much more we could say, and I'm just uh, so grateful to you Thank for you. doing this research and bringing this this kind of confusion and the lack of clarity about the definition and and look what happens to it. You know, like every constitution has this, not every, but so many constitutions have this as part of the. You know, there's an article about respecting human dignity, but you know what? I think what your research shows is that it's not just Egypt that is suffering from this confusion, but you know, right here in this country and all over the world. I mean, I think there's an epidemic of indignity that, and I'm so happy there are people like you who are doing this. You go, girl. This is great. Thank you. Thank you. Really great.